All right, so everyone, I think uh, we can very slowly start. Also, for welcome to you all online. Um, so we're like uh, probably 15 here or something, uh, 15, 16, 20 maybe even. Um, and we are about, uh, I think there's 60 online currently. Uh, there will probably come some more as they realize that our Twitch link is the stream link currently because uh, there's apparently a limit on the Discord voice chat, uh, which is totally fine. Yes. So welcome to this Interpretability Hackathon. Uh, and it's the part of the Alignment Jams, uh, which is like a program we are running and have just started. So it's uh, number two uh, out of, you know, we had one uh, last, or like one and a half month ago uh, in Black Box uh, Investigations, which is like a specific agenda on like AI psychology or what you would call it. And um, what we see for the schedule for this weekend is basically that uh, we'll start here with a little intro uh, and I'll do an introduction to the starter resources along with some logistical things. Uh, and then Neil Nanda will speak about uh, transformer interpretability, uh, which is more related to uh, language models and so on. Uh, and all of this is recorded and live streamed. So if you have any friends who want to join online, you're welcome to send the Twitch link that I send in Discord. Uh, and you're also welcome to check out the recording later. Uh, and that recording will be available for all the people internationally who are not in a time zone that is compatible with our current starting point. Uh, and then we are hacking away at the jam sites and online for about 40 hours. Uh, I think maybe 40% of us are fully online, I do believe. Um, but that shouldn't stop people, I do believe. And um, then on Sunday, uh, everyone will spend like four hours judging each other's projects based on some criteria that I will explain later, uh, along with the process for this. Uh, and the judges will like manually rank the, the, top, uh, the top four for the prizes. Uh, and the winners will be announced. And uh, we'll have like a little, uh, a little champagne popping or whatever uh, we'll end up doing on Sunday evening. Um, and what are you going to do? So you're going to, under the topic of neuroscience and AI, basically create a product, like a research product that represents uh, the research you've done this weekend as a group. Uh, so you're joining groups of one to six. Uh, and we recommend going like two to five maybe, uh, because it's always nicer to, uh, to travel together with someone on this journey, on this fun journey of hackathoning. Uh, and then uh, you hand in the product, uh, the PDF, or uh, what it ends out being, uh, on Sunday before, in our case, it is uh, 1 o'clock PM. Uh, Central time, it, uh, Central European time, it's uh, 2 o'clock, I do believe. Uh, and remember to add your teammates and so on. I'll talk a bit more about that as well. Uh, and there's a template for the PDF submissions, but, um, but you can also write up your own uh, if you prefer that. And why are we running this? Just to get a little context. So we are a part research. We run some different programs that are like focused on getting, giving people pragmatic research experience within uh, ML and AI safety research. Uh, so this is part of that. And we hope this can like be a journey uh, to, to further your own research path as well. Uh, and we'll try to help with follow-up publishing and, uh, and just assisting with like taking the project further if you want. Uh, of course, if you don't want to, we're not here to control you. But uh, if, if, uh, if you just want like, more low effort, then there's, uh, we have some newsletters as well that will have weekly opportunities in AI safety that you can join. Uh, and with interpretability specifically, like this neuroscience in the brain, we want to understand how, uh, how AI, this alien brain, thinks uh, so we can uh, reverse engineer the algorithms it learns on the training data and so on. Um, and wow, I will say, so this screenshot was taken two hours ago, it is now, I think, like 10 more people have joined. Uh, this was supposed to basically just be like two to three locations and just a test for if we could do it several places. So I'm really happy that everyone joined and uh, it's really exciting uh, that uh, people are so interested in it, uh, especially also the jam sites. Uh, so super, super amazing. And um, just to, to have a little disclaimer here in the beginning, uh, this research can be a bit hard, uh, so just keep the hackathon hat on and uh, keep the spirit up and, and have fun and use it as a learning journey, use it as something where you can explore this in depth. Uh, and then of course we recommend you have a product at the end, no matter the quality, like it doesn't matter. Uh, that's not the main point. The point is to have fun and explore these topics in depth. Uh, and you'll really be surprised at what you can do. Uh, and it's up to you how much you wanna balance the learning versus execution time. Uh, so, 30, 70, 70, 30, who knows, somewhere in between, some, some mix of it all. And um, yeah, and when it comes to the teams, you know, this is a bit of a deep dive into uh, this sort of topic. 
So communication is key, and you know, being sure that you can you can communicate across time zones if uh, if you're online as well, uh, and then agree a bit on commitment levels, or at least know what the others uh, go for. You don't all have to have the same commitment level. Uh, just make sure that no one's disappointed at the end, or like bad vibes happen. Uh, just have uh, have fun, and um, time management. Like just to figure out, maybe you want to figure out what your schedule should be for this weekend as a team. Uh, that's probably a good idea. Like when can we be together? When should we have like a couple of meetings here and there? Should we start with two hours of just, uh, of just idea generation before we even eat dinner maybe at like late night? Uh, who knows? And uh, just to give you a little context on the previous hackathon. So that was uh, an experimental first. We had a one jam site and uh, uh, one online location, I don't know what you would say, but uh, that, that was a bit international. Uh, and 15 participants, eight entries, and uh, it seemed like everyone loved it, so I hope you will as well. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll hear from you in like a post-hackathon uh, survey to just make sure that, that, uh, yeah, that it's been valuable and it's been fun and we can improve. Uh, so you'll, you'll hear from us afterwards as well. Uh, and we had like a 50-50 female-male ratio. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case in this room at the moment, uh, but, uh, but we hope to, to make this better in the future as well. Uh, and on average, people spend 17 hours, uh, just to give you some context, uh, during this weekend of 40 hours. But you are, of course, welcome to spend anywhere from three hours to 35 hours, which some people spent, right? Uh, so, and, uh, and yeah, impressive research output uh, either way. I think uh, we were very impressed, and uh, I'm excited to see what the projects uh, you come up with this weekend are as well. And just to share what are the teams and what are the locations, so on Discord, we have like the centralized place where everyone can connect and there's a lot of you know, question answering and you can search for teams and you can just write where you're from, what you're doing, uh, what you're interested in uh, and people can connect and I encourage you just, you know, if you find someone that has described, uh, given an intro to themselves, um, then just like make a thread and be like, hey, I would love to join your team and, uh, and then some more can write uh, if they want. And then we also have the Galatown. This slideshow is on the Discord, it's also different other places, but mostly on the Discord. And um, it's like recommended that you jump in there and feel the hackathon spirit if you're working online. Uh, and we've, uh, yeah, we've set it up to my dice. I hope there's enough space for everyone because there are a lot of people, uh, which is very good. Uh, and uh, it, should be, it should be cozy in there. And then we have the French, we have the Danish, we have the Estonian, we have the Londonian, or UK, uh, here. And we have the Georgia Tech uh, crew. Uh, and then there's also just arrived some from Israel and some Stanford University people. Uh, and then shout out to some places that wanted to join, uh, but couldn't uh, find time for it before. Uh, that's these places, Berkeley, Netherlands, Germany, India, Norway, and Sweden, and maybe they'll join uh, next time, so look out for that. Uh, and of course, thank you to all the wonderful local organizers for making this happen and for helping us out. Uh, there's a role on Discord as well, so you know, you know who's, uh, uh, who to contact in, your different, uh, in the different channels. Uh, so there's like country-specific channels at the bottom of the Discord. And this is the Hagathon space, which I think looks great. Uh, very fun, just so you know, just so you're enticed and jump in there uh, at any point in time, of course. And now just to get into what is like, just to introduce interpretability in general and what this neuroscience on the brain actually is about. Uh, so basically we're looking at these alien brains. Uh, we expect them to be super intelligent in like 20 years, 15 years or something. Uh, and then what will these brains actually look like? Uh, maybe five years for some, maybe, maybe 70 years for some others. But uh, what will these brains look like? And can we actually anticipate something about their structures? Uh, and then, um, you know, just like human neural networks to some degree, they learn algorithms. And can we reverse engineer what those algorithms are to like understand it better? Can we translate it into human language, what these features mean, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of safety relevant uh, work related to this. Uh, and we are going to look a bit more into the mechanistic approach to things. There's also a couple resources on the resource page for the traditional interpretability, uh, but, but the mechanistic work, which is this more functional, more uh, analytical on the, which algorithm has, has it implemented, uh, seems more, uh, well, it's more contemporary, it's more modern, and seems to be the, uh, the major paradigm for actually getting useful knowledge out of, uh, yeah, scientific knowledge out of these neural networks. And, um, which alien brains are we generally working with? Of course, we have the language models, the contemporary language models that are giant. Uh, they're usually transformers. They're also used for a lot of other things. Uh, mostly language seems to be their forte at the moment. Uh, convolutional neural networks, they're used a bunch for uh, image interpretation and classification. 
and uh, we'll also see a, a few of those in some of the starter resources. Uh, and neural decision trees and Q learning is more like uh, reinforcement learning. You've probably seen uh, you've probably seen Alpha Zero, and it's beating Leo, Leo, Leo. I don't remember his name, but Leo, no, Leo Sedol in uh, in Go. Uh, so that was uh, I think Mu Zero even, but Alpha Zero beat uh, beat everyone in chess. And uh, these use decision trees and Q learning and so on. Uh, and then multilinear models. That's the traditional. That's just statistics. You know, uh, do our our models that are like quite simple. Can we also use some interpretation to understand those and then maybe expand to, to larger, uh, larger sizes? And for this weekend, um, we have like different options or like uh, I've set different tracks, but you're of course welcome to go any direction you want. Um, and just to quickly show what they are, uh, each have a color and a number, pedagogically, right? Uh, so first one is transformers. That's like quite in depth, quite technical and uh, about language models and some of the biggest models we use today uh, in production and in, uh, in most of our work, and also some of the ones that safety researchers are most interested in, and some machine learning researchers as well. Uh, and here we are, we're looking at some resources that are uh, expert, and East Transformer by Neil Nanda, who will also introduce that library, uh, and uh, the logit lens on uh, yeah, a bit of the logit lens on what these things are. And you can, you can see much more in all the resources, and this is probably a track, if you don't know about transforms already, that'll probably be a 70% learning and 30% execution uh, kind of project, but also something that will be super valuable for your future career. Uh, then there's image models. Image models are like, that was the hype in 2015 when Chris Ola was like, here you go with all these cool models, and then we can interpret what each neuron sees. So that's where you might have seen uh, stuff like this dog in Deep Dream where you excite a neuron that sees dogs everywhere. And uh, if you look closely, maybe it's not, it's not super visible, but it's basically a lot of, a lot of small dog images and you have like, excited this neuron to show something, you know, its interpretation of what, what an image that has maximum amount of dogs looks like. Uh, so these are the, the things that are, like, sparked some of the interpretability excitement back then. Uh, and there's some tools, some visual tools that are quite intuitive here and quite fun to play around with. Uh, so this is more, you, you can do this, uh, yeah, you can do this relatively uh, more easily. Uh, and then you have language more generally, like this is more black box investigations, as some would call it, uh, and basically AI psychology, uh, what do the language models think, except we have a bit more insight into what language models think when they say things compared to what humans think. Uh, so we, for example, can get what are their probabilities for different words coming up next, what is my, uh, what is like my uh, expectation for the next word given all these different uh, other words and what is my branching, branching world of, uh, of which future uh, text I see. Uh, and there's some tools we have here. Of course, we have GPT-3. Uh, that's a couple of ways to interact with that. We have Loom, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, something uh, developed uh, also at Conjecture and uh, some, 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 uh, some different labs also before Conjecture for that matter. Uh, but it's like, it's quite an in-depth tool to investigate language. And then there's the OpenAI Playground as well. Uh, and you can just write me or, and uh, I can share uh, some, some different API keys for GPT-3, for example, so you can just use it uh, for free. Uh, yeah. And then we have the last one, which is more like a miscel miscellaneous. It's like uh, reinforcement learning and statistics. So uh, there it's, you know, you can investigate toy models of misalignment and show, okay, if this, um, if this chava walks into a wall, maybe he shouldn't, or something like that. I don't know, I don't know. You can do a lot of things. Um, and these are also, this is also where you would probably investigate newer models and more of the just statistics world as well. Yeah. And, bing. So just diving into the tools. Let me see the time. I should be all right to talk a bit about each of them. Uh, but there's notes on the website. So this is a link to the, um, to the page where they're all listed. And there's notes on how you might use it for this weekend's project as well, um, many of the tools. So that's view here. Each of them are marked with their respective track as well uh, for, uh, yeah, for ease of use. And uh, these are the, the two sort of the, the many uh, different pages there are. And these two first ones, they are uh, the East Transformer examples that uh, Neil Nader will also talk a bit more about. Uh, just a few notes on Colab, uh, which maybe he'll also mention that, but basically the free Google Colab isn't, doesn't have enough power to, or doesn't have enough juice to run these models by default, um, but you can 
uh, you can like use some tricks uh, and just write us if you have problems with that. Uh, you can use some tricks to download them and uh, requantize. Anyways, you can do things that make them work. Anyways, yeah. And this one is like quite an in-depth tool for understanding what language models see. So this is also transformer, you know, one and three. Uh, but uh, it's quite nice to see a lot of different things that are quite interesting. Uh, and just a mention is also that the website says unsafe, but uh, you just say advanced and it goes to the page and I trust everything about this website. It's just researchers who are building their own tools, you know. Uh, it's not a public, public thing, so. And then we have the OpenAI microscope, which looks into what do big models that are quite famous, so VQNet, uh, AlexNet, InceptionNet, and so on, how do they see data? How do, they, how do the neurons react to different things? And you can really dive deep in this one. You can like, uh, click through everything, uh, which goes deeper, deeper into every single neuron or every single layer and so on. And then we have the Logic Lens, which is a Google Colab uh, that goes through a, a version of looking at language models where you see what do they believe is the next words. Like what is their belief about the next word instead of uh, looking at some other things that other people might look at. Uh, and this is quite a good way to, to, uh, to understand language models and to, um, to infer some different things about them uh, and what they want to do in life and in text. Yeah. Uh, and then we have the activation atlas, another image uh, version. It basically looks at different layers in a model. And then uh, you have all these images that like, play up into, um, I don't know, yeah, that, that is sort of a 2D mapping of all the reactions that neurons have in the layers. So you can see that uh, you can't see anything here, but if you could, you can see that there are some neurons that react very strongly to uh, dark fur or to fireboats or something like that. And you can see uh, if you select a final classification, for example, fireboat, then it's a, it's a result of, uh, of boat, of water, and of fire, and that's great. Yeah. And GAM changer, which is a great name. Uh, it is one of those like, more statistics tools. Uh, it's used to investigate are there misinterpretations from a multilinear model perspective on what data means, what the different features means. Uh, so for example, in this case, uh, I do believe it's like the house price given the garage size. So this is the garage size, this is the house price. And then, I, I don't know, you wouldn't expect a larger, a larger garage to mean a lower price. And this is something that you can that you, like, dive into uh, with this tool. Uh, which is quite interesting from that perspective. And the what if tool basically investigates some kind of factuals and language models and classification and so on. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's maybe you want to use it. I think some of the other tools uh, are more interesting, um, but this is also an option and does some counterfactual analyses. And then we have, this is a library, IML, that uses traditional interpretability methods and just exposes these methods and functions and tools um, quite easily. And you can probably find a bunch of tutorials online about it as well, also on the link, I do believe. And we see this mapping projector, which basically shows a lot of um, um, how, like if you, well, the projection into an embedding space of language. Uh, so this is something that language models uses a lot, and it, it basically denotes the relationship between words uh, in the world. And, tokens and so on. And this is useful to understand, okay, are there some uh, biases that appear or some, uh, some misinterpretations based on this relationship? Um, it might not be super relevant, uh, but it's something to play around with uh, because it also gets fixed inside of the networks that use these, uh, these spaces. And we have the LIT, the language, uh, language interpretability tool, I think uh, it's called. And this is something from Google. It's just like you can upload a bunch of data, some models, uh, and investigate a bunch of things about it. Uh, that's sort of it. I think it is more traditional interpretability, uh, but, uh, but it is quite interesting to look at either way. And this is a little tool that looks into the brain of AlphaZero uh, and what, uh, what it, like, which moves it takes and so on. Uh, might be a bit hard to use for research because it's more of a visualization tool, uh, but I think it's an interesting entry into that sort of sphere. And then there's two notebooks that are more like introductory to transformers. Uh, and you can use those. So one is an actual introduction to transformers. Uh, there's also a notebook from Neil that I'll uh, introduce later, uh, introducing uh, more like from scratch uh, how to implement transformers. And then an example notebook that you can like run through and see how have they made it, uh, made it work for Portuguese to English translation, which is pretty fun. And from there, you can, of course, do interpretability on what that model ends up looking like because you have access to, to all of them. 
Uh, and Deep Dream, that's the dog. Uh, it's, a, it's a notebook that looks at like neuron activations. So this is, for example, a, a dog detection neuron, probably, that looked and was like, everything is a dog, and where is the most dog? Um, and that's what all these, uh, what all these swirly, swirly, swirlies uh, look like. Yeah. And then there's two notebooks. One is an R notebook, one is a Python notebook. Uh, and these should already have the GPT-3 API key in there. Uh, I'll delete it after the hackathon, just for anyone who wants to mine crypto with GPT or something afterwards. Uh, maybe not. But they're there. They're there. And they are square. Um, and then we have the bird risk library, which is, it, is, uh, it visualizes like the internals uh, of the BERT models, but also just of transformers more generally, bidirectional uh, transformers, and so on. Uh, and it's used by some of the other visual tools. So for example, expert uses it. Uh, so maybe you can use it through there and then dive deeper with this library. Uh, and this is Loom. That's like an in-depth language investigation tool uh, where you can, you can really go deep here and like make giant stories and like multiverses of stories. Uh, and it's quite interesting. Uh, it requires uh, just Python to set up, uh, but that should be all right, uh, I do believe. And then we have uh, Neil here. Um, and this is a video that like, introduces um, GPT-2 implemented from scratch and also shows a bit of the workings of Easy Transformer, the library that uh, he will also talk uh, more about in his talk. And then we have uh, some different resources, just a bunch of links. So we have interesting Twitter threads about research, you know, how Twitter is used these days, it's used greatly, uh, and we love it. Uh, so some people have uh, made interesting Twitter threads. Uh, then we have like research resources and books. So uh, yeah, there's actually just one book. Maybe that would be a bit much to read a book this weekend. Um, but there's a bunch of papers that you can look into uh, related to this. And uh, 13 tutorial and deep dive videos into some of the, um, into some of the things we've been talking about here uh, and the research that's related to that. Yeah. And then, of course, we have the AI safety ideas, which is also a tool we like, uh, have set up uh, for everyone to share their ideas and say they want to collaborate on it. And also a possibility for team making or uh, matchmaking uh, between uh, new friends. Basically going in and seeing a, an idea you like, clicking I want to collaborate or uh, I'm interested in this idea. And then you can see each other's uh, profiles and connect through that. Yep. And a few more logistics. Uh, so submitting your project is basically, you're on this itch page, which I assume basically none of you have met before. It's used for game jams, which are hackathons for game development. Uh, but we are using it here for alignment jams, so uh, hackathons for our wonderful little uh, research field. And you go up to the right corner, you say upload new project, and you do the things that it says here. And just remember to add your teammates from itch.io, so they'll also have uh, usernames, I presume, uh, and have joined, of course. Um, and then you click on the jam page, you click submit your project, uh, and then you select the project that you've just made, basically. Uh, and then there's three questions, not that it matters too much. But it should be started now, the jam, so you can actually already click submit your project uh, on the page. I assume none of you are done yet? Mm. Maybe? No. All right. Uh, and then judging and rating. So because there are so many, uh, last time we did it, uh, we had uh, me and our researcher, Faisal Bades, who looked at the projects and uh, analyzed, you know, are these, uh, yeah, just uh, rated them, basically, and uh, manually. But that's a bit much for 50 projects in four hours. So this time we are crowdsourcing the uh, ratings as well. Basically what will happen is that um, there's this judging period of five, uh, four hours, and you will receive five random projects that, uh, that you, can, you can rate on uh, five different criteria. And this rating is like, um, um, yeah. Then after you're done with these five projects, then you can rate whatever projects you want, basically. But just to ensure that you're not all rating your friends' uh, projects five stars and everything. Uh, so that, that's just the basis there. Uh, but if you, if you make it uh, past the five projects, then uh, of course, I don't know, you can rate all your friends at five. Uh, probably not. Don't do that. And uh, yeah, and the criteria on the, on the next slide here. And then the winners. Uh, will be uh, selected by us just so we uh, <laughs> ensure that there's no gaming of the system. Uh, of course, we assume there isn't, uh, and, uh, and we, it'll probably be match the, like the uh, crowdsourced uh, judging as well. Uh, so I hope you are off that, and uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how it works. Uh, also a bit of an experiment, but we'll see. And the criteria are basically just with different weightings as well. Uh, they are like how relevant is it for AI and machine learning safety, uh, how good are arguments for why this result matters uh, in the longer term for uh, the safety of future systems, like how much we understand them and so on. Uh, the interpretability, 
is like, okay, how informative is this for the field of interpretability? Does it play into existing paradigms? Do we see something completely new, a new version uh, of, yeah, of, uh, of, uh, of looking at interpretability and neuroscience and AI? And the third is novelty. Have we seen this before? That's it. Uh, generality. Do, uh, do we expect that your research will generalize? Uh, and we you know, assume that we don't have to check this, but that you've checked it yourself in the research report. Uh, and of course, we also assume that you only have a weekend to make this, so uh, we know that. Uh, but it's just making sure that you've tested all, this, all of the relevant uh, hypotheses or research questions that you have to test to conclude the things you conclude. That's sort of it. And the reproducibility is basically, um, do, you have a, do we expect this to reproduce? also related to the generality? And do you have a GitHub that we can just run, or do you have a collab or something that is li clearly linked so we can rerun it very quickly? So that's a mix of these two. And uh, you can read these, these are on the website as well. Uh, you probably forget it before Sunday, but uh, we can remind you as well. Yeah, and uh, after the hackathon, we can help you like, finish and publish your work. Uh, so get it into possibly conferences or journals, possibly just uh, as preprints, possibly just as forum posts uh, on, forms related to machine learning and AI safety. Uh, and then we'll try to pay for the publication fee if there is any, uh, and co-authorship and so on. Uh, and also, there is Remix, which is a program uh, that which application closes, I believe, it is Sunday. I'll write an email to them and ask if, if we can get that extended, uh, if you find this work really interesting, because that's basically, they'll get 30 to 50 people uh, into Berkeley and just do this sort of research. Um, or related research in interpretability for, uh, for a couple of months. And you can also continue your research on the AI Safety Ideas page uh, and follow our updates on, e on machine learning safety just because we'll share opportunities every week. Uh, so they are available for you. Uh, and these are, of course, linked here as well. And now uh, we'll introduce Neil, Neil Nanda, uh, and his work on Easy Transform. Uh, we will try to get this to work. I do believe is Neil in here? No, he is not. That is a problem. Um, I do think. Hello. Yes, perfect. Neil, do you want to share your screen? I believe you can do that. Yes, perfect. Sure, I'm attempting to. Yes. Does this work? Clearly unclear. Yeah. And I'll get it up on the screen for everyone. This is tech. Beautiful. Yes. Nice, nice. I should note I'm getting hearing myself with a five second lag in your end. Yes, uh, you can also mute the Twitch stream, uh, which probably makes sense to do. I don't think we are able to see. Ah, yes. Oh, uh, which one? Here? What do you mean? Oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, it's just if uh, Neil also wants to share his, uh, his uh, video. But. Yes. I will have video on. Yes, your video is on. Awesome. That's perfect. Nice. Huh, I think um, maybe start and stop your stream again. Can others uh, see the stream online? Ah, there, it works. Nice. Beautiful. Can I jump in? Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, where do you need to stop? I think. Yes, I think, uh, I think we are ready to start. Awesome. All right. So... Is the stream still working? Um, yes, uh, cool. I can see you. 
So, hey, Neil, uh, mechanistic interruptibility of Transformers researcher, and uh, yeah, Esben invited me to come and try their attempts to give a talk. Basically, attempts to be inspiring and talk about why mechanistic interruptibility is cool. And um, given that I do research on transformer interruptibility, this talk is roughly going to take the structure of me briefly outlining what that even means, and then giving a sales pitch on five categories of hackathon problems that I'm particularly excited about, uh, which may have some overlap with what Esmond did because we did not coordinate well. So apologies in advance. Um, but, all right, let's so go to begin. What even is mechanistic interpretability? And why am I putting this weird, overly pretentious word at uh, the start of the word interpretability? So, the way I conceive of it, field of AI interpretability is about trying to, in general, understand how do systems work? Um, what can we understand about what they're doing and why? Can we come up with explanations for why they do what they do, etc.? Uh, mechanistic interpretability says, okay, we have a neural network that can do a task. It is basically this inscrutable pile of matrices. Um, yet we know that when we multiply these matrices together in this certain way and do some weird voodoo in the middle, they are capable of performing some sophisticated task picture I have here is an example from a image recognition model. And the qu core question is, can we reverse engineer what the algorithm the system has learned is? Where, in theory, if this went, like, incredibly well, we'd understand it sufficiently well that we could just write a program ourselves that did this. And the kind of core weird claim about this is but there is some actual human interpretable algorithm to understand from a model and to reverse engineer from its weights. Uh, kind of analogous to taking a old binary um, of a program and then trying to decompile that to the source code. And this is kind of a weird claim. And this picture is one of my favorite concise demonstrations. There's some substance to it. Uh, so what this picture shows is uh, a lot of the early mechanistic work was done on uh, image, image classification models. And what they found was that often individual neurons within the model corresponded to meaningful, understandable concepts. Here we have neurons corresponding to cars, corresponding to car, bod sorry, car windows, car bodies, and car wheels. There's a neuron in the next layer that corresponds to a car. And there's this just extremely clean algorithm for how these are assembled. It says, let's make a 5x5 five five grid. If the top has windows and the bottom doesn't, if the bottom has bodies and wheels and the top does not have wheels, it's probably a car. And extremely legible and understandable structure. And, well, I don't know, I think mechanistic interpretability just has it's a lot of fundamental, fascinating scientific mysteries to it. Uh, one way I like phrasing it is, it is just a fact about the world that today we have computer programs that are capable of speaking English at a human level, like GPT-3, Chinchilla, Palm. Um, these are sophisticated programs that can talk in basically human understandable English and do weird and sophisticated tasks like explaining jokes and summarizing text. Fact about the world. Uh, we do not know how we would write a computer program in like a normal programming language to do this. Programs that can do tasks that we fundamentally do not know how to do. Uh, and this is just a thing that offends me about the world, and I think that this is actually a tractable research question we could make progress on. And I also think this actually has meaningful consequences for alignment, because 
In my opinion, a lot of the core alignment problems basically boil down to we have a system which does things that look sensible and helpful and reasonable. But we have no idea whether it's doing things that are sensible, helpful, and reasonable, because it is a sensible, helpful, and reasonable system that wants what we want and is trying to be helpful, or because it is an evil, deceptive system that wants to stay here for the world, but it's realized that if it doesn't do what we want, we'll just turn it off. So it deceives us into thinking it's the perfect system until it has enough opportunity to stop us interfering with what it wants. And on the surface, these will look exactly the same. So we need some way to distinguish between two systems that do the same task in the same way and understand how they do it. Opinion, mechanistic interpretability has had enough promising results that I think it's one of the most promising ways we have to do this. And I also think that it's just a really young research area that weirdly few people are working on. Incredibly depressing, but also exciting from the perspective of because there are just lots of low-hanging fruit and lots of open problems. The kind of stuff you need to learn to be able to contribute to the field is just like really not that deep. And I'm going to spend the rest of this just giving a whirlwind overview of categories of problems um, that I think have stuff that you might actually be able to make progress on. Um, this is basically the talk version of this Google Doc that I'll be linking, um, where this is an extremely long list of concrete open problems in mechanistic interpretability, uh, some subset of which I think is actually suitable to do in a hackathon. And I have uh, five categories. And so before I jump into these, um, I'm a mechanistic interpretability of Transformers researcher. And I'm most excited about um, work that is actually engaging with how do Transformers work? And what can we understand about them? And what are the big meaty open problems we have here, and what kind of things might help us make traction on those. And uh, before I jump into discussing those, it's probably worth just first giving a whirlwind overview of what is a transform. And uh, so this is a diagram from the notebook that Esmond mentioned, where I have implemented a simple version of GPT-2. There's an accompanying video tutorial, and so the core thing a transformer is trying to do, or at least a GPT-2 style transformer, which is the main type I care about, is um, we've given it a sequence of text, and it's trying to predict the next word. Um, a, we, uh, more specifically, we give it um, a sequence of text, we break that text down into tokens, which are basically subwords. And then for every prefix of the sequence, it tries to predict what the token after that is, putting a probability distribution over possible next tokens, and then we score it based on how good it is. And the key factor in, um, the key thing to have in your head when thinking about transformers is that fundamentally, they are sequence modeling machines. They are neural networks that are designed to take an input sequence in of semi-arbitrary length and to be able to output um, sorry, to be able to output um, something that is some function of that sequence. But importantly, because they want to be able to take in sequences of varying length, in theory, any length, though in practice that doesn't work for a variety of reasons, um, they use the same parameters to do processing in parallel at every element of that sequence. Uh, note that this is importantly different from architectures such as recurrence neural networks or long-term, short-term memory networks. And go through the text iteratively and do processing on each subsequent token. 
Transformers have a stream of information where each position of the sequence has associated information. And it's doing the same processing in parallel. And the transformer is made up of a bunch of layers that consist of attention heads, which can move information between positions and figure out where information should be moved from, where it should be moved to, and what information should be moved. And MLP layers that are applying processing in parallel on each sequence position without moving, without moving any information between positions. Each layer's output is added to this thing called the residual stream, which is this running tally of the accumulated outputs of all layers. And this is input into each subsequent layer until at the very end, we just apply a linear map, some voodoo called a softmax to convert this to probability distributions. This is a shockingly nice structure from the perspective of trying to interpret it, because um, I don't expect you to have fully followed the details of that because I'm aiming for a whirlwind tour. But at a very high level, there are these bits that move information between positions. We have these extremely legible things called attention patterns, which are basically, uh, which looks something like this. They're a, a grid where for each element in the sequence, and each, um, for, for each pair of elements in the sequence, there is a weight for how much it moves information um, from the first thing in that pair to the second thing in that pair. This is a single attention head, and by hovering over the text, I can see where it's moving information from. So here is the dash token, and it's moving information from is, uh, so I, should probably, I should probably zoom in more. Moving information from these, um, with the coloring corresponding to how much it weights the information it's copying from those positions. Uh, at other things, it just like copies information in place. It doesn't really want to move anything at all. Um, and this is just a very legible thing you can get out of the network. Um, and this doesn't mean that it wants the semantic information of deck odor and auto it could be the case that in previous layers this moved information from earlier in the sentence and this is copying over that moved information but it's just like this beautiful legible thing that lets us see how the model is moving information around and all right that's enough on what is a transformer uh what can you do about this what kind of problems are interesting and worth digging into uh so I have this library called Easy Transformer, uh, which there'll be a link to, which is designed for mechanistic interpretability of transformers. In brief, it lets you load in a bunch of open source models like GPT-2 and OPT, along with a bunch of smaller models that I've trained myself. It loads them into this nice, consistent, clean format. And then it has this mechanism called hooks that let you access or replace any of the intermediate activations or kind of intermediate calculations within the model. And this lets you both fully access, expose, and poke around in the model's internals. And this also lets you, um, this also lets you uh, intervene on things. So you can look at questions like, if I delete this head, what happens? If I replace this head's output with that head's output in another sentence, what happens? And there is also a demo notebook that will be linked, and a bunch of other resources. Um, a uh, general meta point that I've... One of my hobbies is creating educational interpretability resources, and I have... Um, will give out uh, links to a bunch of these. Uh, many of these are currently non-public. I'd appreciate if people do not make a link public uh, at the moment, though sharing with friends is fine. And I would also highly appreciate receiving feedback on what is good, what is bad about the resources, and how they can be made better. But, um, all right, whirlwind tour. Uh, the first category of problems I'm super excited about people looking at 
is investigating what's going on in a small language model. Um, we, an Anthropic, we wrote this paper called a Mathematical Framework for Transformer Circuits, uh, where we looked at one layer and two layer attention only transformers. And in my opinion, got a lot of pretty deep and important insights about how language models in general work. Uh, this is a video walkthrough I made of the paper, which is hopefully a gentle introduction, but actually trying to read it. Um, and I both think there's lots of open problems about small models that have yet to be answered that you might be able to get traction on. And the, these questions might have like deep, actual deep implications for understanding what's going on in real models. The most important thing we discovered was this structure called an induction head. Um, so induction heads are a circuit where two attention heads in a model, remember attention heads are about moving information between positions in the sequence, learn to cooperate with each other. And the task they're doing is that the transformer has realized often you get repeated sequences within text. And an induction head says, has the token that I'm currently looking at ever appeared before in the sequence? If yes, what came after that token? And then let's copy that to the current position and predict it will come next. And at first glance, I don't know, text has repeated sequences, transformers can do this, big whoop. Uh, but this actually turned out to be a really deep and important insight about real models. Um, we um, found these heads were just universal. They appear in basically every model we're looking at, we've looked at, with at least two layers, so you can have the two heads composing together. Here is a mosaic that I made uh, with a plot showing uh, each plot corresponds to a different open source model. Like here's the smallest GPT-2. Uh, the y-axis is the head index. The x-axis is the head layer, and so each of these corresponds to, like, say, head 4 in layer 3, and the color is how induction is this head, um, based on just giving it some repeated random sequences and seeing if it looks in the right place. And 14 models in here, from, three, from like, 1 million parameters up to 7 billion, and they all have induction heads. Some of them have a ton of induction heads. Um, and these also turn out to be the root behind some much deeper and more interesting capabilities of models. For example, we found this induction head that can also look at repeated sequences between languages. Um, this is a head which has learned to attend from a word in French to the thing after that word in English, or from the thing after that word in German to the thing after that word in English or French, and then successfully predict that the German word for temple comes next. Um, we also found that these are used for weirder behaviors like few-shot learning, um, and uh, explaining what this is is probably too in the weeds. Um, but you can go check out this paper if you want to understand what the hell's going on. Um, and yeah, this thing, by looking at a two-layer attention only model, it turned out to be a really deep, true thing about how models in general work. And there's been very little effort looking at one-layer transformers with MLPs or three-layer attention only models. And I think there's just potentially so much cool shit you could learn. I'm particularly excited about is people looking at the MLP layers of small, say, one layer transformers. Uh, in Easy Transformer, I've loaded in a bunch of small toy models that I've trained, um, so you can go poke around with them. Um, the library lets you easily load in uh, models like that, and yeah, I think that pick a neuron in a one-layer model that seems like it might have some meaning and try to reverse engineer it. Or pick a task that a one-layer model can do. Um, E.g., I trained these models partially on Python code. 
code has lots of interesting structures. Give it some Python code. Look at things it knows how to do, like end lines with colons, and try to understand how this works. Um, I also give an accompanying resource called um, Lexiscope, where uh, this is a really janky website that I made, where for every neuron in a bunch of models, I gave that neuron billions of tokens of text and looked at the text that most activates on that neuron. Um, and this, often, neurons will pick out um, one cluster of text that has some shared meaningful property. Um, here's one of my favorite neurons, which activates on news articles about football, um, and activates on the first token of proper nouns, like gunners, or wenger, or the name of this person who I presume is a footballer. And if you just scroll through, there are a lot of news articles about football in here. Um, there's a bunch of neurons that I don't understand. Like, here's a neuron in the middle of a GPT-2 small size model, that activates really strongly on with in some contexts, but completely not in others. What's going on here? I have no idea. There's lots of interesting questions, just looking at neurons and understanding what kind of stuff models learn. Also provide a tutorial for building this uh, interactive version where you can just type in text and it will live update. Uh, well, it will live update if I don't have problems with my live demos and show you which things the neuron activates on. Um, and this is a random neuron in GPT-2 small, which likes activating on sequences of numbers. And I think there's lots of interesting, I don't know, I think it would just be an awesome hackathon project if someone came out of this weekend being like, I think I mostly understand what's going on with this neuron in this context, and here's a bunch of evidence of this. A different category of problems. Um, I'm aiming for Whirlwind Tour. I will send around the write-up with a lot more detail on each of these questions. I'm generally just trying to, like, spark people's curiosity right now. There was this recent awesome paper called Interpretability in the Wild out of Redwood Research. And uh, it was trying to understand this task called indirect object identification, which is how... Um, if you have sentences which contain two names, like Bob and Steve had a lot of fun at the hospital, and then a sentence uh, where one of them does something, the bone two, the correct answer is Steve, not Bob, because Bob is the subject of the sentence, so it's not going to be the object. Um, and they found that GPT-2 small was just consistently very good at this. Uh, GPT-2 small is a 100 million parameter transformer, the uh, smallest version of the GPT-2 models, and it's both very small by the standard of something like GPT-3, so you can easily load it, run experiments on it, and play around with it in a notebook, but also large enough that I think it's a genuine challenge to understand it. And in this paper, they managed to reverse engineer this sophisticated 26-head circuit inside the model, which basically runs the algorithm of um, detect which names in the sentence are duplicated, um, look at the names which are not duplicated, and predict that those names come next. Um, and this is an awesome paper both helped develop a lot of techniques for doing this kind of thing, um, but also just found some really wild, unexpected shit in models. Like these backup name mover heads, which are heads that do the job of moving the correct name to the output. But they only do things if the main heads doing that task get deleted. If this gets deleted, the backup head takes over, but it otherwise doesn't really do much. Why does this happen? I don't know. Probably because the model uses dropout, 
but it kind of happens in models without dropout. Another really weird thing is it uses these induction rates. The purpose of the heads over here is to detect duplicate tokens. The easiest way of doing that is the duplicate token head that checks the copies of the current token. Induction heads only activate if there is a copy of the current token, though they are instead doing the task of predicting what comes next. But for the purposes of detecting duplicate tokens, uh, turns out both duplicate token heads and induction heads work. We have induction heads around, so it uses them too. I don't know. And there was a bunch of other cool shit in this paper. Um, and I think that given that they've done a lot of the work, um, there's both a lot of really interesting questions building on what they did, and also a lot of um, ways you could just take another task in the style of indirect object identification and just try to get some handle on what a model like GPT-2 Small is doing, or one of my smaller toy models. Um, here's a notebook I made where I just go through a bunch of what I consider kind of a basic table stake exploratory techniques for trying to interpret a language model and demonstrate how I would do this for a uh, demonstrate how I would do this for a, for a new task like indirect object identification if I wanted to get a start on understanding how the model does it. It turns out that this, um, and I recently made this as a admissions task to my stream of the Surrey Max program. People had five to ten hours to do this, and I got some pretty awesome submissions. So I think you could like actually make a lot of progress during a weekend hackathon with several people. Um, just drawing out two of my favorite techniques. There's this thing called direct logit attribution where you just say, okay, the output of the network is the sum of the output of every layer, which includes the sum of the output of every head. Um, and then there's a linear map converting this to the um, logits, which are a thing that then gets turned into a probability distribution over next tokens. So I can look at how much each head in the model's output contributes to the correct token. And this is a heat map of every head in the model, colored by how much that head contributes to correctly predicting what comes next. And we can just immediately read off the um, two of the main heads that they in the paper found were the name mover heads that were responsible for moving from the right position to here. And we can corroborate this by visualizing attention patterns for ourselves other anthropic library called Piesfelt. Here I've just visualized every head in the model. There's only 144 of them. My other favorite technique is this thing called activation patching. The idea of activation patching is you can run the model on two different inputs. Um, one with, the co with a correct answer, and the other whose correct answer is different. So here, you can just change what the subject is from uh, Mary to John. Then you copy um, one bit of the model on the correct input to the model on the incorrect input and intervene on it to replace that part of the model as it's running on the incorrect input with the output of just that bit for the correct input. And then you see, how much more does the model think, um, how much better is the model at getting the correct answer versus the incorrect answer when I do this intervention? And this is a way of localizing which bits of the model are actually relevant for the task versus which bits kind of don't matter. And so here, I'm patching in the residual stream, i.e. the accumulated, the kind of what the model has in its head at a given token position. For, and each cell of this is a different patching run I did. And what I found is that on the second subject token, Mary, 
Um, if I copy over the residual stream, the model goes from terrible, so minus three, to plus four, which is a massive difference on this task. And then around layer um, seven to nine, it transfers to the final token, and then cop patching at the start doesn't make a difference, patching at the end makes a massive difference, and patching at the end here doesn't make a big difference. And this is just a really effective way to localize which bits of the model are doing the task we care about. And there's a bunch more ways you can apply this technique to like zoom in and localize even further. Um, ne uh, how much time do I have, Esben? Oh, I'll... I'll skim through my next. I'll skim through my next two categories of problem and then wrap up. Um, so the fourth category that I'd be super excited to see projects on is rather than looking at transformers, looking at algorithmic tasks. Um, I think that training a model on an algorithmic task and then trying to interpret it can just be a very good, interesting, self-contained project. Uh, here's a video tutorial of myself doing research where I decided to train a model where I gave it no information about which position the different tokens were at and tried to see if I could train it to do a task that needed positional information. And I found that it successfully learned a head whose attention pattern was to look at the current and previous token. So it successfully rewrite this. And this tutorial has an accompanying collab where I train and make some attempts to reverse engineer the model. Um, separately, um, have this paper looking at this task called, this phenomena in ML called grokking. Um, grokking is this weird ass thing where if you train a model on a simple algorithmic task, here, modular addition, uh, mod 113, and train it on, say, 30% of the data, and just keep training it on that data for a really, really long time. So, data point 10,000 times. Memorizes very quickly, after it's seen its data point like 200 times, already basically perfect at the task, and just keeps memorizing the training data stronger and stronger. But on the 70% it hasn't seen, it does terribly. But if you keep training, it suddenly figures it out, and train performance crashes. Sorry, uh, test performance crashes from terrible, so this is worse than random, incredibly good. Uh, the faded lines are five different training runs with different random seats. And what I found is that you can... Uh, if you look inside the model, there's a lot of interesting periodic structure. Like, here are what the attention heads look like. I should really fix that. Um, here is what the neurons look like um, across the possible first inputs and possible second inputs. And everything looks very, really periodic. And then if you dig more into it, it turns out it's actually learned this really elegant algorithm where it says this is actually rotation around the circle by uh, some by the angle 2 pi over n times some integer. I can take the inputs a and b and compose them into the rotation around the circle of angle a plus b. Um, I can then, to get the probability of the output of c, I can rotate back by c and then project onto the y-axis. This is biggest when I have the correct answer, because if I rotate round by a and b, and rotate back by c, and I get to the top thing, that means that a plus b equals c. But because it's around a circle, I get modulo n for free. And I found that you could just actually look in the weights of the model and understand this up that it had learned this algorithm. And also, this is a fucking wild algorithm I did not expect to find. 
And I think you could just threads you can build on my grokking work with. And just loads of potential algorithmic tasks you could train a model on. And I have a list, a brainstormed list in here. The final category is so a big open problem in transformer interpretability is this weird phenomena called super polysemanticity or superposition. Um, superposition is this weird thing where it turns out that models can do compression. Normally, when models want to represent some feature, like a car window, or this is a car body, even uh, this is the token node versus structure, uh, they pick a direction in feature space, uh, like the model's intermediate calculations, which are vectors, and different features should correspond to different directions, and if you've got 100 dimensions, you can fit in 100 features, because there are 100 directions. But it turns out, you can actually compress more than 100 features into 100 dimensions if you're willing to let your directions not be perfectly orthogonal and get some amount of interference in. Anthropic had this recent wild paper called a Toy Model of Superposition, where they trained um, some different kinds of tiny models whose inputs were independent, randomly generated features, and um, they had to project the features through this small bottleneck dimension, and then project them back out to a big dimension, to the, like, the same dimension as the input, and were trained to be an autoencoder, which means to approximate the input they got. And they found that as they varied some of the parameters of the setup, in particular, making it so that the model was unlikely to see any two features at one time, the model went from five features to each have their own dimension to some mess like this, where um, every dimension contains two features, uh, one in the positive direction, one in the negative direction, or whatever the hell this mess means. And they found some really wild structures. So here, they found that if you dig into how the model has chosen to represent things, and what fraction of a dimension each feature gets, you get this bizarre quantum energy level style diagram, where features have spontaneously sorted themselves into, say, fitting four features into three dimensions as a tetrahedron or three features into two dimensions as a triangle, or uh, eight into three dimensions as this weird-ass shape called a square antiprism. And as you vary some of the parameters for how bad the interference is across, like, a very long way, um, the model goes from get dedicated dimensions uh, to a bunch of tetrahedra, and then a bunch of triangles, and then a bunch of digons, and it's just wild. And they end the paper with this list of open problems that they really wish someone would go and explore. And they also provide a collab notebook. And um, I also have an unpublished draft of a video walkthrough of this paper that I can also link. And yeah. Um, Thus ends my Weldon's tour of five categories of concrete open problems and accompanying resources that I would be really excited to see people work on during the Sackathon. Um, again, apologies, that was a Weldon's tour. I was optimizing for speed and sparking curiosity more than making sure everyone understood as I went. But hopefully something in there sparked your curiosity and is something you might want to go explore. Um, I should flag, I do expect you to spend at least several hours doing general learning and education if you want to pursue some of these problems, especially the more ambitious ones, and I think it's a lot more likely that you make some progress and learn cool things than, like, really solve it, but I think it's very much in the spirit of a hackathon to pick something you just want to learn and understand, and something ambitious, spend half the hackathon just speed running learning about it 
and then the other half just like speed running, actually trying to make some progress. Really understand everything, and even if you might have some holes in what you're doing, and don't expect to finish. No, you can actually do real research on real problems that matter, and hopefully there are enough resources provided that you can hit the ground running. I'll end things there. That's a beautiful loop. Yes. And basically, there, there. Um, well, let's just keep it at this. I'll I'll be in the loop uh, in the matrix here. Um, basically, the last points is just that the team make up like uh, making teams and so on. There is the channel searching for teams. Uh, again, and if you can't find a team, just write us or uh, or just like seek out. And uh, additionally, I assume many of the jam sites will have like people uh, joining up together. Uh, and I encourage you to not get discouraged by not finding teams and just write us uh, if um, if there's a problem there. Uh, this is very fascinating, Infinite Loop. I love it. Um, and uh, otherwise, are there any questions? Then you can write them in the chat or uh, say them physically or uh, or write them on Twitch as well. Uh, I'll try to just get the uh, the chat up here as well, so we can see that. <laughs> well, I can't see it, but <laughs> someone might. Uh, Jessica. Hi, Neil. Um, how did you go from looking at the neurons to figuring out that the model was implementing that gorgeous circle algorithm? Yeah, could you hear that, Neil? Otherwise, I'll just repeat. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if you could repeat, that would be helpful. Okay, so basically, how did you figure out, based on the analyses you could do, uh, that it did the beautiful circle algorithm, the Fourier transform uh, process? And um, it, was, it was an addition task, right? That was the algorithmic task you were testing. Uh, yes, modular addition. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to give a very brief sketch of this. If you want the full answer, you should go read the paper. Um, but very briefly, um, so you can break down this circle algorithm into these lines of algebra. Uh, sorry, this goes from bottom to top for some reason. Into these lines of algebra. Uh, sorry, can people see my screen? Uh, cool. Great. All right, so you, yeah, this goes bottom to top. Um, you can break it down into these lines of algebra. You learn a lookup table mapping the possible inputs to these terms, sine wa, cos wa, and you can just literally uh, read off um, from the model. Um, the model just contains a thing called the embedding, which just is a lookup table, and you can uh, just read off from this what it's learned, and you find but it's learned, so each of these bars corresponds to cos and sine of some frequency, frequency given on the x-axis. Blue is sine, red is cos, it's the wrong order, whatever. Um, and we see that it's learned like six frequencies and basically doesn't care about anything else. Um, the bars basically show how much the model cares about that. And you can kind of think of these as just like random error terms, while these are the things that matter. I emphasize, it's really surprising that this is so sparse. It normally just looks kind of uniform across all of them. It then learns to multiply things, and this corresponds to the neurons having this weird periodic structure, where you can uh, use a technique called a 2D discrete Fourier transform to uh, convert these neurons to a combination of terms of the form sine of some multiple of a, um, or cos of some multiple of a, times sine or cos of some multiple of b. And when you do that, it turns out that each neuron corresponds to some linear combination of terms like this for a single frequency w, and then the map from the neurons to the logits is just a linear map. 
and you can just literally read off the, the direction in neuron space corresponding to the cos w a plus b term, um, which we can tell because we can just, we know the neurons are representing these, and we can just look at which linear combination of neurons gives us this answer, and then look at the map from that to the logit c. And we see that that always corresponds to, uh, pretty well to this. And likewise, wa plus b corresponds well to this. So you can basically just read off the model the algorithm that it's implementing. It's wild. I did not expect that to be happening when I decided to look at grokking. I just thought, ah, oh, it's a one layer model, it can't be that hard. It's probably just doing addition in some sensible way, like how a computer would do it with an arithmetic processing unit. But nope. Weird trig-based bullshit. And yeah, you, I, uh, I think you also yeah. mentioned on Twitter, right, that it, it took you like 10 days of looking through this to figure it out, right? Uh, kind of. Uh, a decent chunk of the groundwork had been done by uh, a collaborator who was working on this work in the project before I took it over, called Tom Lieberum, uh, who now works on the Deep Mind Interactability team, and he discovered things like shit sure looks periodic, mm. um, or I think at least that the attention patterns sure look periodic, and then I just got incredibly nerd sniped for a week and a half, and by the end had figured out two-thirds of the algorithm, a slightly incorrect version of the third bit. Yeah, rock and roll. But quite exciting. That was a fun week and a half. <laughs> the joy of getting nerd sniped. Just like keep poking at the thing. You just keep being able to get traction and learning more about it. It's wild. You could have an entire weekend of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what lucky people. Uh, are there any, uh, any other questions out there? I should flag. I'm pretty happy to take questions for the next like half hour, but I don't know when you want to wrap this up. Yeah, and there's one question that says, uh, as mentioned earlier, that using the Easy Transformer library can be difficult to run in Colab due to it being quite resource intensive, but there are workarounds. Could we elaborate more on this? Uh, I think maybe you can elaborate, uh, Neil? Sure. So, um, based on the tests I tried doing, I think it should be mostly fine in Colab, uh, but Colab will give you a different GPU uh, when you try using it. A different GPUs to different users, and some of these will be worse than others. And the core problem is if you try, uh, if it exceeds your GPU memory, then your notebook breaks. So there are a couple of different solutions you can have to this. Uh, I'll just like go to a notebook and type things. Uh, so the command to load in a model is this uh, from pre-trained, name of the model, like gpt 2 small. A couple of things you can do. One of those things is uh, just to use a smaller model. I include a bunch of toy models, like um, solu1l is a one-layer model using this Activate, neural activation designed to make it more interpretable called Solu. Um, distill GPT is half the size of GPT too small. Um, I should really write up documentation of what models are in there, um, but these three should basically be sufficient for this weekend. What you can do model equals model to. Uh, so if you load the model in on the CPU, which will have a lot more memory, um, can uh, um, convert it to uh, float 16. By default, it uses 32 bits for each number. It tells it to use 16 bits for each number, and then move it to the GPU. The GPU is called CUDA for reasons you don't need to care about. And this will take up half the memory, it will, it will also be faster. It will probably also introduce some weird approximation errors 
it's probably not that big a deal, but things might break. Um, the other two workarounds are you can just pay for a collab subscription. I think the cheapest version is either ten or twenty dollars for a month. Um, also use paper space gradient, um, which is this alternative to collab, which I think may involve a bit more setup effort, but also is in a bunch of ways nicer, and does things like actually gives you a virtual machine you can SSH into, and I believe is more reasonably priced and gives you better GPUs. If you want to pay for it, the free tier is probably good enough, and I believe is better than the collab free tier. And yeah, I have not used this extensively, but some Seri Matt scholars of mine have said it seems reasonably good from their poking around at it. Um, and I think this is like, yeah, the free version is probably fine. The eight dollar pro version should definitely be fine. Um, I have no idea if a part is able to fund people for that. Also, I hope a lot of people here can spend eight dollars for thing they're spending a weekend on. Um, at yeah, those are the workarounds. Yeah. Uh, you can also not put the model on the GPU, but that will make things incredibly slow. So I don't recommend it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, like if there's anyone who are constrained by this like eight dollar price tag or something, then we can cover it. The main problem for us is like transferring money internationally. Uh, so. Like if, if, it's, if it doesn't matter, then fine. If it does matter, then uh, we'll of course just uh, cover it. That should be fine. Um, any, any other questions then? Yeah. Uh, maybe just another note on that is general advice. I think that uh, you do not want to spend your hackathon doing compute setup. If you have not used this kind of thing before, use Google Colab. It takes care of all of the setup for you. It is janky in a bunch of ways, but this is worth the trade-off. Paper space gradient is comparably easy to set up. Then there's a bunch of stuff where you actually just like rent your own cloud computer, <laughs> uh, which can work a lot better. Paper space GPU cloud is a good place to start. But if you haven't done this before, don't try. <laughs> this is my advice. Though, yeah. if you want to continue working on the stuff post the weekend, it's worth figuring out how to do it properly. Yeah. And I think also, like, you can imagine if you price your time at at least $10 an hour, then it'll quite quickly be worth it. <laughs> so that, that's, uh, that's also a little, uh, a little heuristic. Yes. Uh, if there's no other questions... There are also hopefully... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there are also hopefully people around you in the hackathon who can help you with things like collab setup. Uh, and I, I, it seems like based on the demographic and uh, who's arrived that there probably are people who can help, uh, maybe even beyond <laughs> some collab stuff. Um, otherwise, if there's no other questions, I think we should just get going. Uh, and here we'll jump into the other room and uh, also get a bit of dinner. Uh, I think they're already in there with that. Uh, and in the other jam sites, maybe there's also dinner, maybe there's not. Maybe, uh, maybe you just want to get going already uh, and online. Maybe have your own food. Now it's all, be, uh, all about food, but uh, you can also just set up teams and uh, have a good time. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, yeah, I put the doc in general. I look forward to seeing what people come up with. Yeah. And again, a lot of these are experimental educational resources. Please give me feedback. Good luck. Perfect. Yeah. Well, have a good, uh, have a good hackathon, everyone. And uh, we'll see you Sunday. And if